All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it's about five after. Uh, thank you and welcome. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for our Navigating the New Autism Diagnosis Series for Young Adults and Adults. And my name is Janet Jones Jordan. I'm one of the uh, outreach directors for Autism Speaks, and I'm joined by my colleague, Marianne Sullivan, who is helping us with tech support tonight, and also our other outreach director, Colleen Sheehan. Uh, and we're so grateful to be sharing with you on tonight. And for those of you who joined us last week, thank you so much for joining. Uh, Marianne and I are also parents of sons on the spectrum. Uh, so this information is so relevant uh, to the many families, not just to us, but the many families that we serve. Uh, next slide, please, Marianne. Uh, Colleen Shan will begin today's program uh, in a conversation with, uh, we have Sonia Chan and Brandon Adjumani, uh, who are all self-advocates and they've both volunteered to share their stories and their journeys to an autism diagnosis. Uh, they both were diagnosed later in life. And then following that conversation, you will hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Amanda Platna. She is Platner. She is a licensed psychologist and director of adult services for the Emory Autism Center and the assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavior Sciences at Emory University School of Medicine. And she will be joined by her colleague, Holly Abernathy, who is a counselor at the Emory Autism Center. Then you will hear from Krista Stevens. Krista is a colleague and a director of state government affairs who is with Autism Speaks advocacy team. And then we will round the evening off with Tony Hernandez. Tony is also a self-advocate and he is a part of our autism response team. And, uh, and he will discuss additional resources that will support you and your family uh, and your journeys. Right now, I am going to turn it over uh, to Colleen Shen, and she will share Autism Speaks mission and proceed with today's program. Thank you, Janet. Well, good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Autism Speaks is dedicated to promoting solutions across the spectrum and throughout the lifespan for the needs of individuals with autism and their families. And we do this through advocacy and support, increasing understanding and acceptance of people with autism, and advancing research into causes and better interventions for autism spectrum disorder and related conditions. Through partnerships and collaborations, we're committed to increasing global understanding and acceptance of people with autism, being a catalyst for life-enhancing research breakthroughs, increasing early childhood screening and timely interventions, improving the transition to adulthood, and ensuring access to reliable information and services throughout the lifespan. Led by our president and CEO, Keith Wargo, our national board, and our senior leadership team, diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion is ingrained within our culture at Autism Speaks. We strive to provide a sense of belonging for our staff and for the many diverse constituents that we serve. It's clear that our mission helps us to grow in new ways and continue to build capacity for a sustaining organization today and over a lifetime. I'm now gonna share a few housekeeping items with you. We are recording this entire webinar and you will be receiving a copy of that recording within the, a couple of days as a follow-up resource. Um, also, because we have such a large audience, we won't be able to answer all of your questions, but we'll definitely attempt to take some. And then please note, because of privacy issues, um, we will direct all personal questions and concerns to our autism response team, or you can contact them directly yourself at help at autismspeaks.org. I would now like to introduce to you our guests for today's program, we have Sonia Shand and Brandon Ajumani. And I wanna just thank you both for being here today. Um, I know both of these amazing individuals and I'm just honored to be able to ask them some really important questions. So welcome to you both and thanks again for being here. So my first question, and I think this is an important one just to kind of start us off, is that we know that person first and identity first language is something that's discussed very frequently in the autism community. So do you have a preference for person first language or identity first language? I'd like to be respectful in how I address you. Sonia, I'm gonna ask you first. Uh, person first is okay with me. Okay, and Brandon, what about you? Hi, um, person first is okay with me too. 
Okay, great. So person with autism, people with autism, we use those terms interchangeably, autistic person, person on the spectrum. And that's important for us to make sure we're respectfully addressing uh, individuals. So thank you for answering that question. I appreciate it. So I want to just ask you each to tell me a little bit about yourselves. Brandon, I'm going to ask you first, just tell us a little bit about you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. So my name is Brandon. Um, basically, I have autism and ADHD. Um, I was not actually diagnosed until I was 18 years old. Um, because of that, life was exceedingly difficult for me in several different ways in terms of making friends, socializing with my peers, being understood by family and people close to me and everything such as that. Um, but as I was getting older and as I got like my diagnosis, things were, took a major turn for the better. Um, I was able to get access to more help, more supports. Um, I went from being a student whose uh, GPA probably deserved a, le a different letter like a G or an H. <laughs> um, <laughs> to being a student who finished an associate's with honors, finished a bachelor's with a 4.0, and now is in grad school um, studying special education. Um, because of the support I've gained from my family, doing a better job at understanding me, and from my own mentor, who's just been near and dear to my heart for the past 10 years, um, I've had the strength and courage to do things I never even dreamed of, like writing my own book and being a self-published author. Um, and um, basically also starting my own, uh, well, start, it's on its first two legs, but it's starting my own mentoring program where I work with other individuals with and without disabilities um, and mentoring them and helping them not go through the same houses I've had to go through, which has been going pretty well um, these past uh, few months. Um, thank you for the wonderful comments that you all are wonderful. Um, but basically the, um, I've I've done just so many things have changed in my life um, just because of that diagnosis, you know, like um, one of them was um, uh, being part of oh, the wonderful Autism Speaks, and I'm not just saying that because I know Colleen, um, Autism Speaks really is just that wonderful, and uh, so is Colleen. Um, I've met so many amazing different people. people and I've been able to just share my time so that's why I'm so big on like early intervention you know because had I've had you know I've, I mean things are going great right now but had I've been diagnosed early you know I could have avoided some of the hassles I went through such as being bullied being judged for being different being made fun of um being discriminated against um and things like that, you know, like I was discriminated against for being different and not being diagnosed, but being different anyway. So I was just deemed as being um, a weirdo. Um, I was di I was discriminated because of the color of my skin from other peers of my same ethnicity because of my arguably darker skin tone um, than my other than the rest of my ethnic group. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, things really, really were tough, you know, but like I said, once I got the mentor, things started getting better. And then once I got the diagnosis, things started getting better. And I'm just really, really grateful for that because had it not been for that, I really don't know where I'd be right now. So, um, you know, the early intervention and getting that support team behind you to be able to support you and help you with your goals is just such a big, big thing to me that peer support, having people, um, you know, those friendships, I feel like those are all very, very important things. And, you know, that's a little bit about me and I'm just really happy to be here and I'm honored to share my story with you guys. Thank you, Brandon. You're just so amazing. Sonia, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Sonia Chand. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I have, um, but I was diagnosed when I was 20 with what is now Asperger's, what, what is what was known as Asperger's syndrome, but is now clumped into autism spectrum diagnosis. Growing up, um, very similar to Brandon, um, I was ridiculed a lot by peers. I was uh, made fun of, and I definitely had, you know, um, a lot of challenges um, in school um, with sensory issues 
being one of them to um, not being able to understand other people or where other people were coming from and always being ridiculed and picked on, but not understanding why. Um, things started to get really bad when I entered sixth grade. Um, I started acting out out of desperation and I, um, I eventually then um, uh, started getting in trouble at school. I became very depressed at school and I was crying a lot. And um, it got to a point where I would tell people about these fake suicide attempts um, out of the desperation that I had um, that I said that I did, but in actuality never did. Um, I had to be put on a psychiatric leave of absence. So I had to go, I had to leave school for two weeks. I had to get a psychiatric evaluation. And during the time that I was off, um, one of the psychiatrists that I saw wanted to hospitalize me, but my parents resisted that. And they found a colleague who was able to see me outpatient. And then um, I, the school started having meetings with my parents not too long after I came back from the leave of absence. They wanted to send me to a school for troubled children because they didn't think I was fit enough to be in the school district. Now, mind you, I grew up in a small town outside of um, Chicago. I grew up in a small town in Northwest Indiana. And people there, um, it was very rigid where I grew up. And um, so they wanted to send me basically to another school because they, they didn't want to deal with anyone who was a problem. They prided themselves on having a four star school district. They didn't wanna be around any kid that was a problem. And so my parents fought that, but even though, you know, they, they had the psychiatrist come and advocate for me, the school had two meetings with my parents. One of the meetings, the school counselor and I think maybe a teacher had told my parents, Sonia will be lucky to graduate eighth grade and make it to high school if she even gets there at all. And uh, in order for me to stay matriculated at that school, I had to be escorted from class to class. I was not allowed in the hallways alone. I was not allowed to eat in the lunchroom. I had to be escorted. So basically what would happen is I would go to the resource room, the special ed teacher or her paraprofessionals would take me to my locker five minutes after the bell rang. Then five minutes before the bell rang, I would be picked up and taken back to the resource room. And then um, this would repeat um, for sixth grade, the majority of sixth grade, I would have to have behavior sheets signed every night. Um, I was not allowed to be left with any of the peers. Eventually they let me invite people to eat lunch in the resource room, but all my conversations had to be monitored. So basically being at school was like being in a jail. If I could make a comparison, I've never, thankfully I've never been in legal trouble like that, but from what I know of what goes on, you know, in the systems and, you know, having watched enough documentaries and TV shows to kind of get this idea, you know, it was kind of no different than being in a jail, except I was not in handcuffs and I was not in an orange jumpsuit and I was able to leave and come back. That was the only main difference. But when I was in there, for all practical purposes, it was like being in school prison, basically. Um, and um, so fast forward many years, I graduated high school. I, um, I, I was very lonely. I had no friends. I basically suffered a lot of ostracism um, because people didn't wanna be around me. Um, and so um, I was really lonely um, and, but I also kind of vowed to myself that I was going to make something of myself at that time because I did not want to continue to live in that shit town. So I left, you know, I left, I went to college. I went and I, I attained a law degree. I got my JD. I worked in financial services on Wall Street for a bit in New York. I changed careers. I mean, because law wasn't for me. I changed my career and I'm actually now a psychotherapist in Chicago. And um, apart from that, 
I also am an avid runner for Team Up Autism Speaks. I ran my ninth marathon just recently in New York City for their 50th anniversary. And I am, you know, and I really do take pride in helping others. Um, I did not gain a lot of support. Having this diagnosis later in life definitely shed a lot of light as to why I had the problems I had and the issues I had. And I also, I remember my parents tried to get me help from professionals, but the thing is those professionals, a majority of them were not qualified. And we'll get into that later throughout as we get into the, the speaking, as, as Colleen moderates more of that. Yeah, thank you so much, Donna, for sharing that. I'm sorry about the experiences you've had, but my gosh, the, the strides that you've made and the success you've seen is just so, so impressive. I'm just, I'm just blessed to know both of you. I really am. So I just have one question that I'd like each of you to answer because I think this is really important that you both have different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Do you think that contributed to a later diagnosis? And if so, how? Brandon, I'm going to ask you first. Thank you, Colleen. And um, yes, I do. Um, so my parents are awesome, love them to death, but basically they were both um, born in the Ivory Coast. Um, in West Africa. So because of that, it, from that, from their like culture and stuff like that, things like autism and uh, other things like that weren't like as prevalent, especially at that time, you know? So they like in their minds, they're not really imagining their son um, of all people being someone that has a disability, you know? And they were quite um, hesitant at first to support the diagnosis, but once I got it, they were much more supportive. But yes, I definitely think the uh, the culture and ethnic background definitely played a role in my later diagnosis for sure. Yeah. And what about you, Sonia? Do you do you think it played any kind of a role? I absolutely do. Um, well, for one thing, being a female, females yeah. tend to get um, diagnosed later in life. Um, my parents, I come from an Indian background. Um, my parents are from India and I'm a first generation American. And there's a lot of denial in that culture um, too, you know, that, you know, nothing can be wrong, you know, and the thing about it is the culture that I grew up in, it's, they pride themselves on achievements, right? And oftentimes, and it's not even just in my household, but many, many households and many people are speaking up about this now that I see, you know, especially in various social media groups um, where basically the underlying message is your self-worth is only what you can achieve, right? So if, you're, if you achieve things, that means you're worthy. If you don't achieve anything, you're garbage kind of attitude. And because of that, a lot of people are, they, they're faced with immense pressure to live up to sometimes unbearable standards. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of this has to do, I mean, by no fault, but I think it's kind of like generational trauma. My parents grew up when partition happened, right? So they had to leave everything behind and go to India because they were Hindu. Um, they saw poverty. And the thing is, I've been to India a few times and the poverty is no joke. You could have, it's, it's right in front of your face. There's no way to escape it. Um, the, you know, and I think, you know, that mentality, that mindset, we work so hard to have a better future for you. It becomes almost kind of oppressive then on the kids because they want them to live up to these standards and many times even live up to dreams that they kind of wish they had for themselves, but couldn't because of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you come from this kind of a culture where it's all about conforming, it's all about, you know, living up to, you know, making sure your achievements are everything. And it's all about brag rights and all this other stuff. You know, when you are on the spectrum, it's even harder to be, to be there, to be, you know, to, to be able to assimilate. And I remember having to go to cultural events growing up or there were times I was sitting on the floor by myself because those kids did not want to socialize with me because of everything that happened in school. And, you know, and it's sad that even some people in my generation still drink the Kool-Aid of that mentality and really would say things, you know, and to the, to the effect of, 
well, what exactly do you have? I don't see a problem. I don't see. And that's the thing with that culture. Oftentimes, as long as they don't see it, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Many people have that mentality. I'm not saying all. And um, I'm just, you know, I'm not saying all Indians are like this, but a lot of people still have that mentality and that needs to change. There needs, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful that the younger generations coming up who've been more exposed to all people from all different kinds of walks of life can, you know, set an example. But unfortunately, there are people who drank the Kool-Aid a little too much and living that kind of mentality. And, you know, the culture also is very sexist as well, you know, so being a woman, they expect more from you, you mm -hmm. know, how you look how you, you know, how you behave, you know, things like that. It's just, it's like that oppressive, once again, oppressive standard of mentality. And it makes it hard growing up when you're on the spectrum. And on top of that, my parents made me go to professionals who are Indian and who mm. use that shaming technique mm. and comparison in fact, I had a therapist who used to tell me what classmates used to say about me behind my back. So kind of goes to show what kind of, you know, things are wow. going on there. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much, both of you, for being so honest about that answer. It's, I think, events like this and having these discussions really raises that awareness. And I think this is so important. I could ask you guys questions and talk to you all night. So, but right now I have to turn it over to our keynote speaker and then we'll have a little bit of time at the end, I hope to ask some more questions to, to both of you. But thank you both again for, for sharing your stories are so important. Uh, but right now I'd like to introduce to you our keynote speaker. Uh, her name is Dr. Amanda Plattner. Dr. Plattner is the Director of Adult Programs at the Emory Autism Center as well as assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Services at the Emory University School of Medicine. And once Dr. Plattner ends, the next voice you're gonna hear is Krista Stevens. Krista is our Director of State Government Affairs here at Autism Speaks. So Dr. Plattner, welcome. We're honored to have you and I'm gonna turn it over to you at this time. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here and, and really grateful to get to speak with you all about um, navigating a new diagnosis. Um, I just want to, um, Holly, if you'll turn your video on for one quick second, I just want to introduce everyone to my colleague, Holly Abernathy, um, who's also here and helped me um, create the PowerPoint for today and get together some resources to pass on to all of you. Um, and she'll be here for questions at the end too, if we have time for that. So. Um, all right, next slide. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so I just wanted to open up with um, two quotes that I think are really lovely. Um, one is on being diagnosed with autism and one is on appreciating neurodiversity. Um, if you don't know, the first quote is by Hannah Gadsby. Um, if you don't know her, she is a lovely autistic comedian um, and I think she's really hilarious. Um, some, she had, it's certainly adult humor, um, but she says, and she's talking about when she was first diagnosed. Um, she also wasn't diagnosed until adulthood. And she says, but as soon as I did get the diagnosis, it was so clear. So many things in my life fell into place and I was able to understand so much of what has only ever confused me. It made more sense than when I came out, it made more sense than when I came out as gay to identify with being autistic. It really feels central to my identity. Um, so you may or may not have some of those similar feelings, but the point of that quote was really about how um, the diagnosis was actually comforting to her because it made so much sense. And as she said, felt really central to who she is. Um, and then um, I, and then the other quote um, says, I knew I was different all my life, even with no knowledge of autism as a kid. And neurodiversity is our way to take charge of the conversation to say that neurodiversity is about the mix of exceptionality and disability that we live with but it's mostly a function. It's mostly a focus of what we can do and who we are. It's a positive thing, not an inherently negative thing. And so I think that it's really important idea behind talk of neurodiversity. It's absolutely not a denial of disability. You can believe in neurodiversity and be very, very disabled. And you can also be very exceptional. 
Um, and that quote is by John Elder Robeson. He's an author and a neurodiversity scholar. Um, he also was diagnosed with autism in adulthood. Um, and I really love the way that he talks about and thinks about um, his diagnosis and kind of how he moves through and functions in the world. Um, and so if you're not aware of him, definitely check him out. Um, but I wanted to open up with these two quotes to kind of get us thinking about, um, you know, the fact that there, there are so many adults autistic adults in this country. And while it may feel really isolating, especially if you're just getting a diagnosis as an adult or if a loved one of yours is just getting a diagnosis as an adult, um, there is a really large and welcoming community here for you. And, and we are really happy that you are here connecting with us and um, we, we want to be a part of your experience, hopefully a positive part of your experience. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so I wanted to start with talking about what is autism spectrum disorder. Um, most of us know at least some of these pieces, um, but things have changed over time. Um, and so I want to be clear just kind of to set the stage. So when we're thinking about autism spectrum disorder, whether we're looking at children or adults, we're looking at differences in social communication, which is kind of social skills and language use and development. And then we're looking at differences in behavior. I'm always clear when I'm talking about this to say differences because I'm looking for what's different from what I would expect in typical development, but not something that is necessarily good or bad. Um, and so I just want that to be really clear. Um, this graphic over here in the darker blue has those two points. So the social communication and the behaviors or restricted repetitive behaviors, those are that darker blue. Um, and then there's associated neurological symptoms. So many folks with autism also have sleep deficits, attention challenges, hyperactivity challenges, um, mood and or anxiety, um, language challenges. Um, some folks have seizures, some folks have self-injury, aggression, tantrums. Um, those are all associated symptoms not necessarily required. So everyone with autism does not have those. Every autistic person, um, some autistic people may. Um, and then there are associated physical symptoms. So lots of folks, autistic folks have um, GI challenges, um, immune dysfunction and sensory disorders or sensory challenges. Um, but the major things that we're thinking about are social communication and behaviors. Again, this when I talk about social communication, I'm talking about the ability to maintain relationships, to, to build relationships, to keep those relationships over time, and to understand the reciprocal nature of relationships. And when I talk about behaviors, I'm talking about restricted repetitive behaviors or behaviors that are just kind of a, not, not what we would see in the neurotypical population or what we would see, but we see them more or maybe we see them less. Um, so different, a different frequency than we would expect to see. Next slide. Um, so when we look for, when we, when we talk about adults, I'm sorry, I just want to, I meant to preface my talk with, I have 25 minutes and there is so much to talk about. Um, so there's a couple of things that, there's a bunch of things that I'm going to try to hit on today. I'm not going to go deep in depth to anything, um, but anyone is welcome to reach out to me. And I know uh, lots of other folks on this call are going to give lots of resources and information afterwards. Um, so we will talk about all of that later. Um, so what do we look for in adults? So one of the things that I wanna be really, really clear about is that while sometimes there are symptoms that look different in kids and adults, we always need to be have a really, really, really good developmental history before we make a diagnosis because I want to know, I need to know that there is evidence of symptoms in the early developmental period. Now, some, some of these symptoms may look different for different people, but, but really, it's incredibly important because autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder that at some point in the early developmental period, we saw some signs of some kind of behaviors and or social development that are that's different. That doesn't mean that you like could have easily been diagnosed earlier or not, but that um, if I look back, if I'm seeing you at, um, I just saw someone write in that they were diagnosed at 54. So if I'm seeing you at 54 years old, when we talk about your developmental history or I talk to siblings of yours or anything like that, um, that I can get some sense of some of the kind of symptoms or red flags that we look for in autism, that those existed in your early developmental period. Um, another thing that's important is that adults, 
Um, there's a variable symptom presentation, particularly for adults. So I think in, in pop culture, and when we think about diagnosing autism, a lot of people think about this idea of like, um, you know, a child who doesn't respond to their name being called, or I put joint attention in here. So joint attention is the idea of like, if I, um, if I see something across the room and I say, oh, Holly, look. And I look at I look at Holly and I look at the object and then I look back at Holly because I'm trying to bring her attention to it. So, for example, responding to name or joint attention, those are really good indicators um, in a child that something is amiss in their development. So something is a little bit off in development, and those would be really good, like kind of indicators to me that I should look for autism. However, um, those are not necessarily good indicators for adults, right? So there, there's a variable symptom presentation. So yes, adults really want to make sure that we are seeing someone if we're coming, if we're going for a diagnosis, um, seeing someone who understands really the nuances of autism and how it presents across the lifespan. Um, other things that I think about when I'm assessing adults, so I think about other areas of challenge, particularly as I showed you on that graphic before, um, I think about sleep, um, executive functions, so things like organizing, planning, initiating tasks, metacognition, behavioral regulation, all of those things. And then I'm going to look at ADL, so activities of daily living. So you could be someone who has very low support needs. You are an adult, you've gotten by most of your life, um, and still there are things that you struggle with in terms of activities of daily living. Um, so I'm gonna kind of look into those areas as well. Um, and then the last thing that we look at is co-occurring conditions. So the most common co-occurring condition um, in folks with autism is, is ADHD, also really common co-occurring condition. It, co-occurring conditions, excuse me, are anxiety and mood symptoms. And this is even higher typically for folks who are diagnosed later in life because you've spent or they've spent uh, you know, a large portion of your life not knowing what's going on and probably as our amazing self-advocate said earlier, being misunderstood. And so it's reasonable to expect that there would be more anxiety and mood symptoms later in life um, or if you're diagnosed later in life. And that's definitely something that we see in the research and clinical practice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I just really like this graphic. This is not, this was not made by me. I put credit on the okay. bottom. Um, I just really liked this graphic. So on the left, it says what people think the autism spectrum looks like. And it's a line and it says on the left, less autistic, on the right, more autistic. And so I think people think about it as a linear spectrum. Um, and on the right, it's actually a circle and it says what it can actually look like. Now, I want to be very clear. This is not what it looks like for everyone, but what autism can look like. Um, they have fixations, abnormal or flat speech, noise sensitivity, social difficulty, anxiety, abnormal posture, poor eye contact, ticks and fidget, aggression, depression. Um, and so I really like thinking about the, the autism spectrum as this kind of circle as opposed to a line, um, because we, we all have kind of different, different levels of coloring in each of those sections, right? Or in other sections that aren't part of this graphic. Um, next slide. Okay, I want to talk really briefly about profiles of young adults, um, especially because I think there are a lot of misconceptions for what autism looks like. Um, I assume if, that many of you on this call have recently been diagnosed or have a loved one who was recently diagnosed, um, but that maybe some of you are thinking that, that a diagnosis might be something that you should consider. So I, want, so I wanted to give some insight into kind of what we look for in adults in terms of strengths, areas of vulnerability. I also want to be very clear, um, you know, there's a lot of talk in the autism community. If, you, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And so I want to be very clear that I'm not saying that everyone falls into these categories, but these are kind of profiles that we see. Um, so some strengths are in intelligence and memory, so strong verbal skills, um, ability to retain information about topics of interest. Um, autistic folks are often really great independent learners and are really great at generating novel solutions um, and a strong aptitude for a certain topic. Um, really, really, we see a lot of really nice strengths and focus in atypical fields of knowledge. Um, so I have someone who I know who is very interested in picking pieces on a map and um, using those pieces on picking like a, a place on a map and then kind of learning about the um, background of the people who live in that place on the map. So they'll pull up the kind of 
um, age back, like different, how many different people of different age categories live there and kind of learn all about kind of who lives in this area of the map, which is really an amazing interest and they have such intense focus on this. Um, Folks are often detail oriented, so they notice small details, um, perform tasks that follow specific rules. Um, lots of autistic individuals have a commitment to accurate work and, and that can kind of lead to some perfectionism um, and adherence to rules. This one is one of my favorite ones when we talk about strength. A lot of times, and I think this is kind of an older idea, but people used to think that autistic individuals um, couldn't be funny because they don't understand humor. Um, but lots of times autistic individuals really have a strength in humor, particularly in puns and sarcasm. Um, honesty, telling the truth and following rules. Um, connection, so wanting to work, wanting to learn social skills and, and really kind of gain insight into areas that are challenging for them. Persevering despite rejection. Um, typically autistic individuals are very loyal and, and really more so than that, accepting of other people, um, which I really um, value. Um, and then commitment to justice. So this is an interesting one. And obviously, again, this is not true for everyone, but we find that a lot of autistic individuals have a really strong commitment to just to justice, to rooting for the underdog, underdog um, and to kind of tolerance um, across um, for tolerance for everyone, um, which is really, um, I think, stems from the experience of being marginalized a lot of their lives. Um, all right, next slide. Um, some areas of vulnerability, so sensory regulation and aversion to or craving for sensory input. Um, this one I think resonates with a lot of people kind of having challenges knowing where your body is in space. So being really clumsy. I know I was looking up quotes by Hannah Gadsby because I wanted to um, talk about, um, you know, Hannah's self-advocacy. Um, and I found a quote about Hannah, Hannah was talking about being really clumsy and never understanding why. And that once, um, once Hannah had the diagnosis, she was able to understand it and, and didn't feel so silly for being clumsy all the time. Um, regulating emotions. So recognizing and understanding, matching emotions, um, regulating attention and impulses. So controlling fight or flight when anxious, switching attention, um, vulnerability, especially for stress, stressful situations. Um, specifically, I wanted to just kind of hit on this controlling fight or flight when anxious um, in particular, because um, I think this is something that I see a lot of times in, in young adults who I work with. Um, this idea that um, sometimes the, the emotions come on so strong that there's really like between respond between feeling the emotion responding to the emotion there's not a lot of time to think about it and so that fight or flight kind of goes right into place and there's usually a, a flight response um, and then rigid thinking so coping with changes in routine exceptions or bending rules um, and then main ideas so generalizing skills um, understanding abstract concepts and getting the main idea from text or conversations. This can be really challenging um, for autistic individuals. Next slide. Sorry, I'm going fast because I want to make sure I get through everything in 25 minutes. Um, we talked. To, I talked briefly about executive functioning. Um, so executive functioning is kind of like the air traffic control center of your brain. Um, and so you may be very, very smart and have lots of things going on, but the executive, the air traffic control folks need to be up there doing that. Otherwise the planes don't kind of go in their, the route they're supposed to go and there could be accidents, right? Um, and so we really want our executive functioning to be working as well as possible. And so sometimes autistic folks have difficulties with things like um, time management, prioritizing and initiating. Um, the next one, theory of mind. So this is interesting because I think that people um, use this to talk about a lack of empathy um, in folks with autism, but, but that's not my intention here. Theory of mind, I'm, I'm thinking about this idea that um, we have to process social information in real time. I have to know that if I'm walking out of a door and the door closes on your foot, you're gonna be like, oh, that really hurt me. And I should turn around and say, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, but but I may not have that ability to kind of make all of those connections in that in the in real time. So it doesn't mean that autistic individuals don't care that they've slammed the door on your face and you might 
might have hurt your toe. Um, it just means that it's harder to kind of make all of those connections in the moment. Um, social pragmatic, so autistic individuals may often feel awkward, may seem rude, um, may have a difficult time interpreting verbal or nonverbal cues. Um, and then self-awareness and advocacy. So, so one of the challenges for a lot of autistic individuals is knowing when to speak up, knowing what your rights are, knowing how to protect yourself. And then the last one I have here is chronic fatigue. Um, and I put autistic burnout here and I will get to more about what autistic burnout is in a couple of minutes. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, so ASD supports in adulthood. So I wanted to think about like what would be most helpful if someone is di newly diagnosed in adulthood, or again, if you're on this call because you have a loved one who's newly diagnosed in adulthood. Um, so we had some thoughts. So what a couple of the things that I think are really important to be thinking about are mental health, advocacy and decision making, family support, post-secondary education, transition planning support and independent living and residential. Now, I'm not gonna talk about all of these topics because again, we have limited time, um, but we did provide resources for all of these topics. And I know that the folks who speak after me are gonna give lots of information on these topics. So I just wanted to put out here that like, if you're, if you're newly diagnosed and you're thinking about, gosh, how do I categorize all the things that I need to start doing or thinking about, here's a good way to categorize these things. Um, and then you'll see our uh, resource section is categorized this way. And like I said, I know other folks on this call will give lots of resources too. Um, I also just kind of wanted to put a little note in here um, for those of you who are diagnosed in adulthood um, or, or have loved ones who are, um, the stats about autistic adults are alarming, right? Like we're not doing enough for autistic adults. And this is not to be depressing and to be like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. But to say like, we have a lot of work to do and there are a lot of us who are really dedicated to doing that work. Um, so if you look at some of these stats, um, only 36% of adults attended, uh, of autistic adults attend, attended any post-secondary education, about 30% attended college. Um, only 19% lived independently. Sorry, it's small on my screen, um, but y'all can look at some of these um, stats later. So a large percentage, about 60% 60, 60 have co-occurring conditions. Um, as someone was mentioning earlier, I'm sorry, I can't remember who we were talking, someone was talking about bullying and victimization. I know one of our two amazing advocates was talking about it, or maybe both of you, 47% of adults, autistic adults have experienced bullying and victimization. Um, so these are really alarming stats. There's another stat I was reading recently that I think 75% um, of autistic adults are unemployed or underemployed. Um, so, so there's really concerning stats, but there's a lot out there. There's a lot of focus at this moment in time on how we support adults better. Um, next slide. Um, so I wanted to spend the most time talking about interventions for mental health and skill development, because um, one of the things I had up there was let's think about and talk about mental health. I, as a clinical psychologist, think about that first and foremost, right? Um, there's lots of other kind of um, services or supports that folks need to get into place. But the first one that I always think about is like, let's support your mental health. Let's support the skills that you need to develop to have a good quality of life. So I wanna talk briefly about therapies. There are a bunch of different therapies. Um, there are lots of different orientations for therapy. There are three types of therapy that, that I know have strong evidence for folks with autism. Now that does not mean that any other therapy is not gonna be helpful, but these are the ones that we know have a good evidence base. So applied behavior analysis, ABA, um, cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based approaches. The really exciting thing is that mindfulness-based approaches have been gaining more traction as they've been getting more evidence-based behind them, which is very exciting, particularly evidence-based, particularly for their efficacy in uh, autistic adults, which is really cool. Um, DBT absolutely is an option too. And so when I say CBT, I think about um, CBT kind of includes um, other therapies that kind of build off of CBT. So ACT, DBT, other therapies like that. Um, I want to talk briefly about groups. So there are skill building groups like the peers groups. Um, if you haven't heard of them, you can Google them. Um, community building groups like meetups and then combination groups. So I mentioned the My Life group at the Emory Autism Center. That 
self like to be fair, that is a group that I am responsible for, but we focus on a wide range of topics of interest. And the intention of the group is to increase quality of life. And so we focus on naturalistic or incidental teaching. So learning skills in the environment where they are intended to be used. So for adults, we learn skills on a college campus because that's when we intend to use those skills. Um, and then psychopharmacology, so medication to treat symptoms or co-occurring mental health conditions. I wanna be really clear that there's not a medication that treats autism, but as we've talked about, many folks with autism have ADHD, anxiety, um, other emotional re emotion regulation challenges. And so there are medications that can support some of those things. Um, all right, I'm gonna go a little faster because I have several more slides that I wanna get to. I'm so Impossible. sorry. Okay. All right. I won't go faster. I just may not get to all of them. That's okay. You'll get the recording. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Kathleen. I won't go people, the deaf person, you know. <laughs> all right. I, I won't go faster. If I don't get to all the slides, they are, they are here and you're always welcome to reach out to me. There are a couple special topics that I wanted to go over, um, but I'll focus on, we'll, we'll see how far we get. So one of them I want to talk about was self-diagnosis. Um, so this is kind of a hot topic in the community right now. Um, I want to say that if you are self-diagnosed, you will be welcome in many autistic spaces. So I, I don't want anyone to feel invalidated if you are self-diagnosed. However, I really want to encourage folks to get a formal diagnosis. I understand it's really challenging because there are not a lot of providers who do that. Um, and that's where self-diagnosis became popular because there just weren't enough people to, to diagnose folks, autistic adults. Um, but the benefits of getting a formal diagnosis are that you get to learn more about how your brain functions. So it's not just about um, do you have autism or not, but you get to get lots of really beneficial information about what your strengths and vulnerabilities are when you think about your cognitive functioning. Um, you gain insight into potential co-occurring disorders or diagnoses that have symptom overlap. Um, and you get access to services if you actually have a formal diagnosis. And so there's a couple of services down below that you would not have access to without a formal diagnosis. Next slide. Um, I wanna talk about autistic burnout and masking real fast. Um, so masking is the idea that autistic individuals force neurotypical behaviors. It's common in females, but also happens in males. Um, it can lead to a misdiagnosis or a missed diagnosis. Um, the idea is that you spend so much time learning what you are supposed to do. And so you do it, even though it doesn't feel normal or natural to you. This is an example, or a great example was from the book, Look Me in the Eye by, by John Elder Robeson, where he talks about how every time he meets a person for the first time, he looks them in the eye, he shakes their hand, he says, hello, nice to meet you. But every time he does it, it doesn't feel natural to him, even though he's been doing it, you know, he does it you know, multiple times a day for years and years. It continues to feel uncomfortable for him, but he does it because he knows he's supposed to. Um, and masking can lead to autistic burnout. And so autistic burnout is this intense physical and or mental exhaustion, loss of skills. Um, and it comes from this, uh, you know, trying so hard to navigate and keep up in a neurotypical world um, and from sensory overstimulation. Um, next slide. Um, so what can you do if you're experiencing this? And I wanted to add this because I, what I've been finding is a lot of adults who I am newly diagnosing as autistic tell me that they've already been experiencing this autistic burnout and masking for so much of their lives. And that's why the diagnosis has come late because of their masking and other things. So first of all, get support, whether that's from family, friend, a psychologist, a therapist, um, anyone who you can trust. Um, learn what your triggers are through the support system. Um, I, I advocate for a therapist. Um, learn how to identify when you're getting too overwhelmed. Um, ask for what you need beforehand. So this may be telling your friends or family, but also like speaking to your um, colleagues or supervisor at work and talking about what you need and what kind of, if there are accommodations that would be helpful for you at work, such as um, being in a quieter space and not having overhead lighting, things like that. Um, and asking people close to you to learn about masking and autistic burnout, um, and then you sharing helpful tips with them about what that feels like to you or kind of what, what is helpful to you when you're in that experience. Um, okay, next slide. 
Um, I won't get too much into the rest of the slides since our time is really up, um, but I just want to mention a couple other topics that I think are really important um, that a lot of newly diagnosed folks bring up and ask me about. So one of them about, is about self-disclosure. Do I disclose my new diagnosis? So a couple questions I put, do I want to share the diagnosis? Who do I want to share it with? When? How much? Um, we have some resources for making self-disclosures and deciding whether you want to do that. Um, advocacy, so our two amazing self-advocates on this panel can certainly talk about how to get involved in advocacy, but I think the first step is learning how to advocate for your needs before you start advocating for the community in general. So thinking about what do you need from your friends, from your family, from your workplace, things like that. Um, next slide. Okay, and then I think this is my last one. Um, <laughs> so the other things, as Colleen mentioned when she started chatting with two of our panelists, um, person first versus identity first language. Um, lots of folks talk about this. It's a really hot topic. Now, if you've just been diagnosed or your loved one has been just, just been diagnosed, don't feel like you have to make a decision on this right away, right? Like your thoughts and ideas can be fluid, but know that people may ask you and I just want people to know what this means. So it's the idea that, do you like to be called a person with autism, an autistic person? Do you not care? Is it okay to go back and forth? Um, I put a link to a really lovely um, article that I found that's written by a self-advocate that talks about kind of the pros and cons of both of them. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to just bring up as kind of a hot topic or a special topic is relationships, dating, and sexuality. So I'm so grateful that the field has moving to, has been moving towards this idea that adults, adults with autism, adults with other disabilities, still want to have relationships and deserve to be able to have fulfilling relationships, right? Um, and so I just kind of want it, want everyone out there to be aware that there is there is support for this, there's acknowledgement of this, there's conversations around how do we make sure that people have knowledge about relationships, understand safety around relationships, and that people understand how to be fulfilled and happy in relationships. I did add um, autistic adults are increasingly identifying as part of the LGBTQ plus community at rates that are three times higher than the typical population. I think this is really important because again, we wanna talk about kind of safe spaces, helping people understand their identity and, and come to terms with their identity, um, whether that's kind of the intersectionality of different identities, right? Um, so I just want everyone to be mindful of kind of these special topics that I think come up a lot as soon as someone's diagnosed. These are the questions that they ask me right away. Um, okay, I'm sorry, that was really fast and a lot of information, but I will stop there. Um, and if you, yeah, if you click to the next, we have a couple of pages of resources. So that this, pa this page talks about mental health resources, vocational resources, transition planning, support, and post-secondary education. Um, and then the next page talks about family support, independent and residential, um, and advocacy and decision-making resources. And if you have questions about any of these resources, you're always welcome to reach out. So Tony, if you wouldn't mind just jumping in and we're gonna roll to you, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Janet, and hi, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Hernandez. I'm with the Autism Response Team, and today I'm going to talk about, you know, what is the Autism Response Team and what, and what is the role that we have in helping uh, people in our, in our autism community with information or resources and supports to help them. So if we can go to the next slide, please. I uh, said, so what is the Autism Response Team? Uh, the Autism Response Team is an information line for the for the whole community. Our team is our, our team members are especially trained to provide personalized information and resources to people with autism and their families. And as you can see on the on the screen, uh, you know the, you see the phone numbers there and also our email, uh, so that in which you can you know you guys you know all of you can reach out to us to our team. And we'll be more than happy to help you. So I'm going to go today uh, in, with the different topics uh, that impact, especially adults in the spectrum. And we're going to talk about these topics in which we receive the most uh, inquiries about. And we're going to go on into that. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, one of the inquiries that we receive uh, from people in our community, especially adults, uh, is in terms of you know looking uh, to be evaluated for autism. 
uh, received questions as to whether you know I may have autism and I'm looking to get you know to have an evaluation. Uh, those are the most uh, common uh, questions that we receive in our team. And as you can see there, uh, we have a guide which is called the Is It Autism? And if so, what next? Which is a guide for adults uh, that, that are not, not only the ones that have been diagnosed, but also adults who might suspect, you know, suspect that they have autism. This is a great uh, introduction guide uh, in which you know, it can help you in getting yourself educated uh, and, and can help you in terms of you know, where to get an evaluation for autism or not. Or if you're uh, diagnosed already with autism, it can definitely help you in terms of the next steps to follow, learn more about autism, uh, what are your rights as an autistic uh, individual, and many other things. So it's a tremendous guide for adults uh, that are in the spectrum. So we go to the next slide. Uh, what are the other resources that we help? Uh, you know, in, in, you know, we have we help people and family in our community is uh, transition resources. Uh, we provide this information uh, uh, of transition uh, toolkits uh, for you know for people in our community. We have different type, different um, transition uh, toolkits, such as, for example. Uh, the toolkit for how to gain uh, employment or to get a job or how to get into college or how to get housing or resident into a residential program. Uh, we provide this uh, toolkits uh, for families and people in our community. So that way uh, they know about the steps and how to better prepare themselves in order to, um, you know, to get the services and the support that they need. Uh, towards achieving their, their life goals, whether it's employment, uh, going to college or getting housing or any other goals. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Thank you. And here, uh, one of the more uh, most uh, common uh, requests that we receive uh, in, you know, in our community is employment. Um, every day, uh, for example, you know, I receive uh, so many emails or, or calls of, you know, people looking for work or having struggles and keeping a job or, you know, having different types of challenges in the marketplace, which is one of the most uh, common challenges in our community, uh, which is in regard to employment. You know, the statistics are out there that between around, unfortunately, around 80 to 90 percent of our adults, you know, of our adult population uh, with autism across the country are unemployed. And a very small percentage, um, you know, you know, it, it is employed, um, you know, full time and most of them part time. So it, this is one of the most, uh, one of the most important topics as an organization that we focus on in raising that awareness in the marketplace, so that way we can indicate our, you know, you know, employers, our businesses, about the things and the and the skills and the experience that autistic individuals can bring in the marketplace. And and as, as you can see on the slide, we have different programs in Autism Speaks. Uh, for example, we have our Work uh, Place Inclusion Now program, uh, which is its main goal is to you know to be able to help employers and help and overall help the marketplace and create a more inclusive environment for autistic individuals. Uh, also, we have another uh, program, which is navigating your differences in the workplace, which is very important for autistic individuals. Uh, so that way uh, they can know, um, you know, that, you know, they know their rights, you know, things that to help them succeed in the workplace and be able to uh, progress towards achieving their career goals and have a better quality of life. And also we have an Employment Wins and Autism Speaks community, which is one of our Facebook groups in which uh, we, um, you know, employers, businesses, autistic um, employees, entrepreneurs, all we, you know, we talk about ways towards uh, finding, creating the programs, the resources and supports. So that way we can hire, you know, we can get more autistic individuals to participate in the marketplace and we provide those resources as well. In, along with other supports and resources that necessary. So we can go to the next slide, please. Now, another uh, uh, common uh, topic that we receive um, in our response team is post-secondary education. Um, you know, for example, um, people, autistic individuals having challenges 
in college or where, you know, what to study, how to succeed in college. Uh, pre we provide information about, you know, for example, grants, scholarships, colleges with autism programs, accommodations uh, for the SAT, uh, consultants, and many, and many, many other information, uh, as you can see on the screen. So that way, uh, autistic individuals can have a successful uh, college career and be able to accomplish their educational goals. And then we go to the next slide. Uh, oh, 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 thank you. And another uh, important uh, topic that in which we receive a lot of inquiries is housing, uh, residential uh, resort, you know, resources. This is one of the more common and most difficult challenges that autistic individuals and also their families and communities face in, is in terms of finding housing. Uh, we provide uh, toolkits um, uh, and also other information and resources available to help autistic individuals, uh, where, you know, whether it's to get their home first, you know, home or, or find, you know, finding an apartment, finding, you know, all the resources that can help them get uh, and meet their housing needs. Uh, we provide uh, that information as well. Very important. Next slide, please. And also uh, in the response team, uh, we provide information to our constituents about government programs and supports. Uh, you know that we, you know, based on the inquiries that we receive from our constituents, uh, we, you know, we, you know, we provide information about programs you know, related to Medicaid waivers, uh, Social Security income, vocational rehabilitation. Uh, going back to the employment side, of course. And also we provide uh, information about state specific programs. Uh, for example, we provide information about, you know, if you're New York, about the Office for People with, Dis with Developmental Disabilities. And also if you're Florida, the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities, which is the CART Center. And overall, uh, we provide information about the resources and the programs and the centers available that can help autistic individuals with the support that they need uh, towards, you know, the, towards achieving the life that they want to achieve, you know, uh, you know, in our society. And then next slide. And, and also, uh, and also very important, uh, which I believe, you know, you know, talking now as a self advocate, is one, if not the biggest challenge that we have as autistic individuals is in regards of social relationship, how to build friendships. Um, you know, this is the most common inquiry that I receive, especially from autistic individuals. A lot of times we have difficult, um, the difficulties uh, towards uh, building uh, friendships. So we provide the information about um, uh, finding the, you know, in other words, we can provide, send, give you information about support groups and social skill uh, programs to help autistic individuals in developing those social skills to be able to build, you know, you know, meet new friends and also in regards to the areas of dating and relationship. Next slide. And also another area that we provide information is also mental health. Uh, we provide information about therapists, counselors, or psychologists, psychiatrists, um, you know, that can help uh, autistic individuals and their families, um, especially with dealing with depression and anxiety, which are the most common challenges that autistic individuals face. We provide that information about resources that can help them as well. Uh, next slide. And also, as I mentioned, uh, we provide information about dealing with behavior challenges that you know, that you all face, you know, the autistic individuals face with resources and supports as well. Uh, next slide. And, and then also we provide information about financial planning or financial resources as well uh, that can help uh, towards um, building your, you know, financial, you know, financial skills and be able to provide that support that, that you need on your daily living uh, in regards to financial skills. We provide that information as well. And then next slide. And also, last but not least, we provide information about, you know, if necessary. I know this is a sensitive, you know, topic, but we provide information about resources that are out there available for guardianship and conservatorship, as well. And last but not least, but it is not all on the slide. We provide information about disability rights organizations, especially for advocates, so that way you, you know, uh, autistic individuals know their rights. And that they have, whether it's in the employment um, area or, or you know, going to college or housing, we provide those resources as well. So to overall, to summarize, 
here in the autism uh, response team, uh, we are here to support autistic individuals, their families, and the entire community with information or resources and supports that can help them uh, in their life. And we are here available, you know, you know, to support you. And and then in the next slide. All right. So again, you see the information of the autism response team. So if you have any questions or any inquiry that you uh, that you're looking for, any information, uh, always feel free to reach to us, and we'll be more than happy to help you. So I want to thank you all for uh, for you know for giving me the time to talk a little bit about autism response team. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to Colin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. That is wonderful, and that's such great resources. I think that we have Krista back. So if we can go back to Krista's slides, I think she's dialed in. Oh, there she is. We can see her. So um, Krista, thank you so much. We're glad you're safe. We're glad you're back. Yeah. And we would love to hear about uh, the advocacy efforts that Autism Speaks is implementing. Thanks so much. Yes. Yeah, so in the advocacy department, we work hard on making sure that some of the systems that are regulated or uh, uh, set up through state law or federal law work to support the needs of the autism community. And there's three areas that we tend to, to put our focus on, healthcare related access, special education, specifically for those with uh, disabilities or, or autism, and then adult services. How can the people with autism thrive in the community as an adult? Now you'll notice all throughout this slide presentation, there's words that are underlined, like on this first slide, the word here, when you get a copy of this uh, presentation, you can click on any of these words that are underlined, and it'll take you to more resources about uh, that we have uh, that we have available to you. So we have a whole list of priorities that we in the advocacy department work on, but I'm just going to go through a couple things for you um, that I think would be most helpful. As we move on, let's talk about healthcare. Um, Individuals with autism uh, have a wide variety of needs um, and need to call upon their health insurance uh, to get those needs met. And the first thing we encourage you to do as you think about what support you need from the medical community and the uh, behavioral mental health community is to figure out what type of health insurance you have. And so that's the first thing we're going to do when you go to our website and you look at health insurance information. We're going to direct you to the next chart. And this looks really complicated, but you're gonna follow a path basically based on what type of insurance you have. So if you have insurance from an employer, you'll see that there's different types. If you have insurance through the marketplace or uh, the Affordable Care Act, you'll see that there's a path to that. But let's talk about um, how these different paths can influence the kind of access you have to different types of benefits. As we move on to the next slide, I first circled all of the plans, um, all of the types of health insurance that are regulated by each particular state in our country. And as you can imagine, each state passes different laws uh, with different regulations about what insurance should provide for the residents. And so if you have one of the plans that is that are regulated by a state, you are going to um, follow those rules and those regulations about the state if you have questions about your access. Again, though, remind you, we have lots of information on our website and you can click on the terms in this presentation that have underlined and we'll take you directly to the information that you need. Let's go ahead to the next type of plan. Oh, one thing, I just want to show you a little bit of a dip, the difference between how different states can deal with um, uh, passing regulations that affect those with autism. So for example, in this graph that you see here, this table, you'll see that Texas and Florida each have different responses for um, whether or not their state insurance law applies to individuals with autism. That is going to um, influence whether people who have these particular types of plans have state protections guaranteeing them access to benefits related to autism. So I just wanted to show you sort of the complexity of the fact that states can handle these issues very differently and you're gonna to have to unravel what your own particular state mandates your insurance to provide. 
going on to the next slide. Here's another example, same two states, Texas and Florida. But you'll see here that they uh, provide different benefit levels for individuals with autism who are seeking ABA. In Florida, unfortunately, we deal with a, a dollar cap and an age cap. Um, and as many of you know, if you take a look at that age cap, age nine, uh, the state of Florida has decided that if you don't get a diagnosis by age nine, that you are not entitled to specific benefits through your insurance that the state protects for those who have the diagnosis before age nine. And we're working hard in autism advocacy to try to um, fight against these types of restrictions because we know as you all do, that many folks don't get a diagnosis by that age. So we work hard and we advocate in Tallahassee, in Florida's capital, to change these, this restriction so that everyone in, in uh, Florida has access to what they need. Let's move ahead to the next type of plan. Well, this is a reminder here. I do wanna point out to you though that sometimes states can um, be more generous than what the state mandate requires. And you can read about this later when you go back to these slides, but sometimes plans will be more generous than what the state requires them to do. And so we want to give a shout out to Florida Blue, which is one of our partners in Florida that has decided that they're not going to restrict access to ABA benefits to just children or just young adults. They're going to go all the way up through age 65. Um, and I have a feeling we could push them to go even farther than that. Um, so that individuals throughout the lifespan have access to the type of behavioral support that they need. Moving on. Okay, here we go. Now, this is actually the type of plan that most Americans have. And these are plans that are obtained through an employer um, or when an individual is in a dependent on an employer policy. And these plans, unfortunately, um, are not subject to state regulations. Uh, so it make it a little bit more challenging to figure out what type of benefits you have. But as I remind you, we are here to help and we have figured out how to help you get the information you need from these employer plans so that you can identify exactly what type of benefits you have and how to access those resources. Moving on to the next slide. Now, if you encounter a plan, an insurance plan that puts restrictions on your access to benefits related to your autism. So maybe they'll tell you, well, you have psychological support. You can see a therapist, but you can only see a therapist 20 times in a year. Those types of uh, exclusions or limitations, we can help you push back against those limitations because there's a whole set of laws that basically tell the insurance companies they can't discriminate against individuals with certain diagnoses. And those types of restrictions, those types of limitations, like a visit limit, is one way that individuals with a diagnosis like autism are discriminated against. So if you encounter those types of exclusions or limitations, please reach out to us. We want to help you uh, remind these insurance companies that they have an obligation um, to comply with the federal laws against discrimination. Now, the first step we want you to do, though, before you reach out to us, you can get a copy of your plan. So through the website portal or through a, a paper copy, that would be great because we're going to have specific questions we need to get answered um, that you can only get from that plan document. Next slide. Now, my, the second step that we'll do is we're going to have, we're going to point you to this whole body of law called the Mental Health Parity Law, and it's going to help you understand, or we can be happy to help, it's going to help you understand how these different insurance companies have to comply with these laws that basically tell them that they can't discriminate against those who have uh, a psychological or behavioral mental health diagnosis. So here's some more resources for you. Let's move on and see what. This third type of plan, um, these are federal plans that are um, for employees of the federal government. Perhaps you've heard of um, TRICARE, which is the military's insurance program, or some of you might be familiar with Medicaid. 
each of those three types are very, very narrow, um, uh, have very, very narrow restrictions. And really, I can't really speak to general things about them because each of them are defined in such particular ways. But if you have one of these, again, we're happy to help, but you just need to know that it's gonna be a very narrow scope to the type of um, answers that we are gonna to turn to to try to find out what your um, plan benefits are specifically. Moving on. Quick comment to those of you who may not have health insurance. Um, those of you who don't have health insurance, we encourage you to reach out to ART, the Autism Response Team, or directly to advocacy and help us help you explore your options because we know that there's a large percentage of people in America who do not have health insurance. And we wanna help you obtain that so that you can get your needs met. So please feel free to reach out. Moving on. Let's talk quickly about special education. Um, in the United States, individuals with special education designations uh, through public schools can often get services, educational services into their early 20s. Um, most of the time we see the stops at age 22, so all the way through age 21. Some states like Michigan, I love Michigan, they go all the way through age 26. So um, again, this is gonna be an area where you see a wide variation between um, states. And that's why in my department, State Government Affairs, we're constantly working to uh, lobby each state so that their services continue to support the autistic community. Now this resource is, that Tony probably mentioned, I just put a shout out to you to it here. This is a new program that we have that can walk you through the whole uh, IEP process, individualized education program that individuals with autism or other disabilities are entitled to in the United States. So you can use this resource and it'll help you get started figuring out whether or not the individual that you uh, know that has autism or that you are, whether or not educational programs through the public schools can continue to support your needs. Let's move on. This is a little bit more uh, information about what you'll find in that guide. It just shows you the table of contents. And for those of you who have walked this path of special education, these terms will be familiar to you. If you haven't, we want you to use this resource so that you can better understand uh, the complexity of special education law in the United States. Moving on. The third big category that we in advocacy work on is how to support those with special, um, with uh, autism diagnoses throughout their lifespan. And so that means all the way through their adulthood. Um, we work hard, right now we're working extremely hard to influence uh, Congress to try to get the home and community-based services um, expanded because we know those are the programs that help individuals in their local communities. Um, so you might've heard of waivers. Uh, that's one example of home and community-based services uh, that we are working hard to get more funds allocated for um, to better support those with autism. Most states have extremely long wait lists for these waiver programs. So if you do not have your name on those lists, um, we have a resource that can guide you towards the appropriate page um, sign up page in your particular state, and you can at least reserve a spot on those waiver wait lists because you never know when you'll need additional support. Even if right now things seem really um, well, even if right now you feel like you're very well supported. And the last thing on the bottom of this slide, you'll see two more links. Um, one is regarding the work that we're doing to advocate for those with autism on the issue of employment. And then the other one is for those with, uh, those with autism over their whole lifespan, how we look at the support they need. And you'll find our list of more priorities. And I want to invite you all, if you take a look at the next slide, to reach out to us um, and help us by sharing your story. Uh, you heard from self-advocates um, and we are always interested in channeling your experience to better um, change the hearts and minds of the leaders that we talk to 
who are in positions of power to really influence how uh, you and the local community is supported by um, uh, the state and the different regulations that are, are set up by each state and by the federal government. So I encourage you to use these links and join our advocacy team so that we can help uh, make this world better for those with autism and help all reach their full potential. Thank you so much. I think we only have three minutes left. So I know um, we didn't have a lot of time for Q&A, but I think just to round out our evening, if I can ask our two self-advocacy uh, panelists just to, for closing remarks, I think that would be wonderful if I can ask you just to keep your answers brief, which I know is hard, but I would like to ask Brandon and Sonia, in a perfect world, what would you wanna see happen in our society to empower and embrace people living with autism and those who love and support them? Um, Sonia, I'm gonna ask you first. I would like to see more support in terms of encouraging people to pursue their interests and not trying so hard to put people in boxes. As a psychotherapist, I can say there is a lot of ableism in the mental health field, um, a lot of discouragement. You know, many people, many therapists have tried to tell me I shouldn't be in this field because I'm on the spectrum. And they have this idea that just because you're on the spectrum, you might not be able to help others and you might not be good at this or any people related field. When people find out you're on the spectrum, they think, okay, you should just be behind a lab or a computer or be an engineer or something. And it's all well and good if that's what you wanna do. But if you wanna do things like we saw an example earlier, there is uh, a comedian who has autism and um, there are other people out there who have autism and have made great strides, right? In all different kinds of fields. And I feel like, you know, encourage, and one thing I would really, hope is that even like for family members, especially, you know, to be more accepting of an autism diagnosis, not try so hard to push it away and be that person's cheerleader and advocate, because a lot of times people will try to bring them down. A lot of times people will, you know, a lot of people have this attitude. If you're on the spectrum, you don't deserve success. You don't deserve to have a life. The only people who deserve it are neurotypicals. And that's simply not true. You deserve to sit at the table and eat like everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sonia. Brandon, uh, like in under a minute, what about you? What, what would you like to see happen to embrace people living with autism in our society? Honestly, Colleen, what I would like to see is just more open-mindedness from society. Like, I would like to see that balance. I've used this reference before, as opposed to thinking that people without autism are over, he are over here, people with autism are over here, all right? Well, it should be, and people with autism need to rise to meet the level of perfection that people without disabilities have. There should be people with and without autism are different, but not less. And it should meet in the middle and help rise to the top together because they're just as important as anyone else. They just learn differently. And people without autism can learn just as much as people with autism and vice versa. And I just like to see more of that equitable, like, um, understanding, you know what I mean? I think that's the biggest thing, just that open-mindedness and just more support overall. Yeah, wonderful. Great advice from both of you. Thank you so much again. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. We know we didn't have a lot of time for questions, but please know they're important to us. And you are welcome to reach out to our autism response team at any time uh, at help at autismspeaks.org. You can also call us directly at 888-288-4762 or in Spanish at 888-772-9050. We also have a live chat feature available on our website at autismspeaks.org in the bottom right hand of the screen. Also, as a reminder, you will receive an email with follow-up resources within the, the week uh, and a copy of this recording as well to view at your leisure. So I want to thank our wonderful panelists again and self-advocates who shared their stories today. I want to thank my wonderful Autism Speaks colleagues um, who contributed to this event. And most importantly, thank you, the participants who are joining us today, because we know your time is precious and we appreciate your choice to spend some of it with us. So wherever you are on your journey, please know that we're here for you and with you, and we'd love to stay in touch. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, everyone, and take good care. Good night.